Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Christopher. I am your outreach librarian. Um, and welcome to another in a series of interviews we're doing where we talk about cool things with cool people. Um, and today's cool person is uh, Cory Doctorow. Um, and Cory Doctorow is a science fiction author, activist, and journalist. He is the author of many books, um, including Radicalized and Walk Away, Science Fiction for Adults, In Real Life, a graphic novel, Information Doesn't Want to be Free, a book about earning a living on the in the internet age, and Homeland, a YA sequel to Little Brother. Um, he has also written Poesy, The Monster Slayer, a picture book for young readers, and his next book is Attack Surface, which is an adult sequel to Little Brother. Um, so why don't, why don't we start there? Uh, Corey, if you wouldn't mind just uh, telling us a little bit about your new book, uh, how it came about, and uh, why you felt Little Brother needed uh, an adult sequel. Yeah, so it's, I wouldn't call it a sequel so much as it's a, a standalone novel in the world. And it, the distinction being that you can have, you can read it without having read the other two. Um, so, you know, as you know, the first two books, they're, they're young adult novels about kids who are kind of seizing the means of computation in a moment of great social turmoil. The, the first book is about kids in San Francisco after a terrorist attack when digital surveillance and physical police presence um, turn the city into something like a police state who use uh, hacked Xboxes and cryptographically secured network protocols to declare guerrilla war on the DHS and kick them out of San Francisco and restore the Bill of Rights. And in the second one, the same cast of characters find themselves custodians of an enormous set of leaks uh, that are quite embarrassing to the government and compromising and reveal a lot of wrongdoing. And they're caught in a kind of pincer maneuver between the military contractors who are trying to get the leaks back before they can publish them and um, some much more radical hacktivists who want to take them all and just dump them on the internet instead of releasing them in a kind of more piecemeal fashion based on uh, their, their salience and relevance. So it, those two books um, had a, a, a really big impact on the world in that um, lots and lots of people have come up to me and said the reason that I'm a programmer or a, um, a librarian or an activist or cyber lawyer or a security researcher or cryptographer or human rights worker is because I read those books and they changed the way I thought about both the potential and peril of technology. And this third one is addressed to a different audience. It's, it's, a, a, it's a book that uh, involves a character who's a sort of minor player in the first two books. She's a um, something of the antagonist of the first two books, this woman, Masha, who works first for the DHS as a security contractor, a surveillance contractor, and then her boss poaches her to the private sector to work for a military contractor in a forward operations base in Iraq, where she's hunting jihadis. And she goes on from there to uh, work on cyber weapons to crush democratic uprisings in the former Soviet Union, uh, surveillance tools that are used by the world's worst dictators. And all the while, her ability to compartmentalize and to rationalize this, um, you know, uh, stuff that is uh, at the best ambigu ambiguous in terms of its morality. I mean, she certainly feels like she's on the side of the angels when she's helping put down uh, uh, ret retributive rape and murder in Iraq as, Bath as retaliation is taken against Ba'athist militiamen and so on. But... Um, you know, she also realizes that she's not on the side of the angels overall, that mostly what she's doing is, is taking the enormous pleasure and power that she got from computers, the sense of control over her own destiny, and using it to strip other people of that control over their own destiny in very high stakes ways. And she comes home to San Francisco after a series of ever more self-destructive activities makes uh, staying in the former Soviet Union no longer uh, viable for her. her. Her hobby becomes teaching the people she's supposed to be spying on how to defeat the spyware she's installing. So by day she installs the spyware and by night she teaches them how to defeat it. And her bosses, when they catch on, are, are really unhappy about it and very unsavory people. And so she flees back to San Francisco and discovers to her horror that her best childhood friend is now a Black Lives Matter activist in Oakland and is being targeted by the same cyber weapons that she herself spent her career developing. And this is when Masha has to really confront the moral dimension of her work. And there are a lot of technologists today in the field who have an enormous amount of labor power and are waking up to it. Um, last year, 20,000 Googlers walked out 
there have been uprisings over facial recognition and drone programs and surveillance programs at Salesforce and Google and Amazon and Microsoft. So there is a whole generation of technologists who never went into industry or the way that they went into industry was informed by this moral sense because they read Little Brother. But there's this other generation of technologists now who are questing after a redemption story for themselves, who want to figure out what it is they can do about the, the shattering walls of the compartments that they have put their doubts about their work into. And this is a story about someone finding their way free of that, finding their way, if, if not to redemption, then at least to a path to redemption. And, you know, it's a pretty urgent moment for that kind of story. Uh, one of the interesting things about certain kinds of technologists right now is that they are in such demand that if they refuse to build things, they sometimes won't get built at all. Right, that, that walking off the job means no one will be able to do the job, which, which gives them an enormous amount of power and an enormous amount of responsibility. Yeah, no, it, it's really interesting here you talk about the book because, um, like you said, it, it very much feels of the moment, right? Um, you mentioned Black Lives Matter, and I was thinking of everything that's been going on with Julian Assange and, and, mm -hmm. you know, over the summer. So this is all stuff that's very much in the air. Um, and, and that's why I'm kind of curious why, um, because as, as a science fiction writer, um, mm -hmm. how do you view science fiction and, and your work there as, as being the vehicle for expressing some of these concerns? Well, you know, there's this idea from Daniel Denning of an intuition pump, which is, um, you know, a thought experiment that you go through in order to prepare yourself mentally for some circumstance that might come later. And I think fiction is an intuition pump, right? Fiction allows us to, you know, mentally run down what it might be like to live through some hypothetical scenario and imagine how we ourselves might uh, respond to it and to rehearse that and to, to try out different tactics. And a, a lot of pulp fiction, which includes science fiction, because of its emphasis on plotting, tends to go for the shortcut in which um, bad things happen and then the people around you turn out to be bad too. You know, man versus nature versus man. The tsunami blows your house down, your neighbors come over to eat you, you know. And uh, that's not really what happens in crises. There's a great book by Rebecca Solnit called A Paradise Built in Hell that really closely tells the tale of just how well we as a species rise to the occasion. I mean, when you think of all the crises that have been visited upon our species over the years and contemplate the fact that we are here today and that the only way we could have survived them was through mutual aid and cooperation, you have to realize that whatever strain runs through our character that sometimes makes us selfish and unworthy, it is countered by another strain that makes us selfless and uh, and caring for one another. I mean, you know, this, this pandemic, for all the deaths, and every one of them is, is a tragedy, compared to the Black Death, for example, is a, a, a relatively mild global crisis. And we, we have to, I don't think many of us understood, and probably we still don't, viscerally, what it must have been like to live through that, right? And, and now maybe we have an inkling and now maybe we can appreciate just how amazing our ancestors must have been, how resilient they must have been, how kind to each other, how selfless, how, for, how far-sighted they must have been to have survived that crisis and the dozens more on the same scale that we know about and the hundreds more that we don't. And so fiction at its best can tell stories about that goodwill. And that isn't to say that the story runs out of plot, um, you know, conflict between people of goodwill who cannot reconcile their differences is far more traumatic than conflict between people who can write each other off as, as unworthy and still never resolve their differences, right? The only thing worse than like losing the, din the dinner uh, argument at Christmas dinner is winning the argument at Christmas dinner because then you'll never talk to those people again and they'll never forgive you. And, you know, I think that, that science fiction in particular, when we're contemplating technology, has a role to play in thinking through what technology can take away from us and how technology can be used to, to get more and to, and to encourage people to put their thumb on the scales for the liberatory power of technology and to understand that while technology can be enormously totalitarian, that this isn't foreordained and that they have the power in them 
to collectively resist that, that um, totalitarianism. But I do wanna say, I did a panel a couple of years ago at the World Science Fiction Convention with uh, Eric Flint and a few other people, but Eric is a labor organizer from Chicago, meatpacking union organizer. And we were talking, it was a panel on um, labor unions and science fiction, particularly like the golden age of science fiction, the sort of thirties to the fifties. And the pulp fiction of that era, Westerns and romances, and detective novels especially, were full of trade unions because they were like an important fact on the ground. They were the source of, of uh, intrigue and of comfort and of power and of uh, corruption and all of the above, right? They're really central to people's lives, but they don't appear in science fiction at all. There's almost no science fiction from that era in which unions are even mentioned. And Eric had a very provocative thesis, which is that the, the science fiction has its origins uh, in engineering circles written by and for engineers. And in the post-war era, the incredible demand for engineers meant that unions were somewhat superfluous, right? That you didn't really need solidarity to, to thrive, right? If your boss was a jerk, you could just fire your boss, right? And go find another boss who pay you even more because you had these super in demand skills. And in that regard, it feels like it, it is a, the biases of that early science fiction are closely mirrored in the biases of the tech industry. And the fate of science fiction is in some ways entangled with that because of course so many techies read science fiction growing up, but also you know, techies are, are starting to discover at least in some fields that they no longer have that bargaining power they thought they had. And that it turns out that the fact that the janitor wanted to belong to a union wasn't because they were lazy. It was because when you have important skills but not skills that uh, are in high demand, not skills that are, that are rare, um, the importance of your skills are irrelevant. They will treat you as badly as they can get away with. And so writing science fiction about solidarity feels to me like a particularly urgent job right now. Yeah, um, and you mentioned um, talking about science fiction and the liberatory power of technology. Um, mm -hmm. That kind of tied in with something I wanted to ask related to attack service attack surface because you just recently had a, a, a Kickstarter to uh -huh. the, the audiobook rights, uh, if, if I'm remembering correctly. So, so I was wondering if you might want to talk about that, why you elected to go that route, and, and what was important to you as a writer to retain those rights? Sure, yeah. So, uh, you know, I didn't want to retain the rights. Nobody wanted to buy them from me. And, and the reason is that I won't allow my work to be released with DRM. And there's, there's a lot of reasons not to like DRM. And I think that libraries and librarians are probably cognizant of a bunch of them, the, the harms to archiving and the potential privacy invasions of patrons and so on. But there's also a wider way in which uh, DRM is, is really toxic, which is the way that it magnifies the power of monopoly. So we live in this very, very monopolized world. And this again is a thing that I think librarians understand at least the shape of if they haven't, but I haven't heard a lot of critique of monopoly per se out of library circles. I think it's probably coming because, you know, the reason if you're an academic library and the reason your textbooks cost a thousand percent more than they did five years ago is because we're down to like three academic publishers. And the reason your scholarly journals cost many thousands of percent more than they did 20 years ago is because of the concentration in scholarly publishing. And the reason that trade books cost so much more as we're down to five publishers, right? And uh, that monopoly is mirrored by a monopoly in distribution. So you have Amazon, the sole electronic bookseller of any scale. That's also the largest publisher of genre fiction through the Kindle program, none of which is available in libraries, right? We, we you know, rightly gave Macmillan a lot of shit for the way that it offered books to libraries, but at least they offered books to libraries, right? Think about what it means for the majority of genre fiction to not circulate in libraries, right? What that will do to the long-term fate of libraries. I mean, libraries are, um, you know, they're old, right? They're, they're not just like older than Amazon or older than publishing or older than copyright. They're like older than paper, right? We had papyrus libraries. They're older than binding, right? We had scroll libraries. So the idea that some like jumped up 
technologist in Seattle can say, well, I know you've got 7,000 years of human history on your side, but I paid some you know, Stanford grad to write this sprawling garbage novella of legalese that says that libraries are no longer an effective uh, uh, instrument in our world today. And I think you'll find it's more important than any 7,000 years worth of sacred human history, right? So that stuff about DRM, that, that monopoly power of DRM is really important. And Amazon, the way that it uses DRM is in sectors where it do has absolute dominance, like audiobooks, it makes DRM non-discretionary for rights holders. So I, as the copyright proprietor of this book, cannot opt to not have DRM. And the way that the law works, Section 12.1 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act works, is that it's, it makes it a felony for me to provide you with the tools to remove that DRM. So once Amazon sells you my audiobook, it's locked to Amazon forever. No one, not even me, can authorize you to take it off of Amazon's platform. Well, anyone who's paid attention to the way Amazon relates to its suppliers knows that as soon as it has the advantage over a supplier, it puts the screws to them. So in terms of my own self-interest, you know, allowing Amazon to lock my copyrights to their platform in perpetuity is, a, is an obviously bad idea. And you know, there's a strain in, um, in uh, sort of digital liberation circles that really doesn't like the term intellectual property. And you know, when you use the term intellectual property, you get these little potted lectures about why intellectual property is a bad metaphor and why it's imprecise and trademark isn't copyright and copyright isn't patent and blah, 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 blah. And, and the answer that the people on my side have to people who say, oh, well, if you don't want me to say intellectual property, what should I say? Our answer is that uh, you should call it the author's monopoly, which is the term that used to be used in, you know, sort of statute of and days. And, you know, rights holder advocates, they bristle at this and they're not wrong because, you know, it's true that like the instant I fixed my new book in a tangible medium, I acquired a copyright in it that endures for 75 years after my death. And that in some really important way, or 70 years, I beg your pardon, in some really important way, that is a monopoly. Like I'm the only person who's allowed to sell that good, right? So like that is the purest form of monopoly we have, but it's not a monopoly that confers market power, right? The fact that like the government will allow me to sue you if you copy my work without my permission, doesn't mean my publishers will pay me more. I don't have pricing power, right? And that in competition circles, in competition law, the thing that we actually look for is not how many sellers there are, but whether a seller can control prices, whether it's not the market, but the seller that controls prices. And here's where it gets really tricky, because although authors don't get market power monopolies from their authors' monopolies, when co corporate entities like Amazon or our publishers acquire a sufficiency of authors' monopolies, and when they marry it to their market power monopoly, they get a kind of self-reinforcing system where, you know, say you want to uh, reach Amazon's audience. Well, to reach Amazon's audience, you have to sell your rights into the Kindle program. Once you sell your rights into the Kindle, Kindle program, you're locked into Amazon's platform. If your audience comes to the platform to find you, then the next writer who comes along want, has to put their rights into Amazon's Kindle platform to reach that audience. So it's a kind of flywheel that gets faster and faster. Um, and it has this other advantage, which is that if you're like a traditional monopolist, right? Like if you're Jeff Bezos with his Amazon hat on and not his Kindle hat on, Congress will drag you up in front of them and your competitors will make complaints to the FTC and they will say, this anti-competitive conduct should be punished by law. Now, admittedly, we've had very little and uh, anti-competitive conduct punished by law for 40 years since Ronald Reagan neutered antitrust law. But at the very least, you have to worry a little that eventually the law will come for you because anti-competitive conduct is at least notionally unlawful. But if your market power monopoly has been backstopped by an author's monopoly or a collection of author's monopolies, then instead of you having to fear your competitors invoking the power of law against you, they have to fear you invoking the power of law against them, right? If you wanna sample music from universal music, the only way you can do it is to sign your rights to Universal Music, because they won't license to you unless you're already signed away to them. So if you just sample without their permission, right, then Amazon gets to sue you, or, or Universal gets to sue you. So the, the combination of authors' monopolies with market power monopolies creates a monopoly that far from being in danger from state uh, action and enforcement, 
it gets the power to invoke the state to protect its monopoly at the state's expense. Right, so, so this is a very powerful and dreadful thing to have. And so all of that is why when Amazon says, if you wanna sell into Audible, you have to uh, take our DRM, I say, no, thank you, I just won't be sold on Audible. Now that has consequences because 90% of the market for audiobooks is on Audible. Uh, it's higher in some verticals. Uh, and, and of course, no Audible original book is available for circulation in any library. Uh, although they will do a deal with you, a very kindly deal, where they'll sign up your patrons for their, for their software and their service, and then they'll spy on your patrons using their incredibly data-hungry client. And again, reverse thousands of years of library practice that says that patrons' privacy should be protected by, by librarians. It's a, it's a remarkably generous thing that they do. It's a wonder that they could amass all those billions being such good-natured slobs. And, uh, and uh, uh, not selling into 90% of the market has consequences, right? Macmillan is like not a charity. They don't want my audio rights if I'm not gonna let them sell it into 90% of the market, so they let me keep it. And I live in Southern California, I live in Burbank, and I live in sort of the belly of the beast. I can walk to Warner and Universal and Disney in about 15 minutes. I, I can also drive to Skyboat Media, which is one of the largest and best audiobook studios in the world in under 15 minutes. And my friend, Amber Benson, who is an extremely talented narrator, also a very good writer, also formerly Tara from Buffy, lives around the corner. So I, I hired Amber. I paid her, you know, SAG after rates, and she recorded my audiobook with Gabrielle or Cassandra DeQuere from, from Skyboat Media directing. Uh, my editor edited it, and we put together a really amazing audiobook. And I'd done this before, but I, I thought given this anti-monopoly moment, I wanted to make a point out of it. And so what I did was I put it on Kickstarter for pre-sales along with the eBooks. And for several years now, Macmillan has been kind enough to let me be my own eBook retailer. So uh, I get the 30% Amazon would otherwise get. So you buy the eBook e from me, I take 30%. That's what Jeff Bezos normally gets. I give 70% to my publisher. Uh, my publisher then takes 25% of what remains and gives it back to me as my royalty. So it's 47.5% all told, almost double the standard ebook royalty. And it's, it's a great system. So I'm pre selling the ebooks uh, or the audiobook. I'm pre selling the new ebook and I'm selling the audiobooks for the previous two volumes and the ebooks for the previous two volumes in a Kickstarter. And it's almost at $240,000 now with about two thirds of the, of the time elapsed. Um, it's done really well. And, and my hope is that it will do well enough that on the one hand, Macmillan will, the next time I do a book deal with them, say, you know what, we'll pay you a decent amount of money for your audiobook rights, and we're gonna partner with you to produce it and pre-sell it on Kickstarter platform, uh, at where, you know, incidentally, the retail cut is 5%, not 30%, which is what Amazon takes for, for audiobooks. Um, and uh, then we'll have an afterlife for it in all the audiobook stores except Audible, right? It'll be an Audible exclusive. It will be exclusive of Audible. <laughs> Right? And, um, and if they do that, I hope that some other best-selling authors will go, you know what, we can actually do this, not because we want to make the moral point, which you know, we want to make, but not if it means not paying the rent, but because we can make more money by having an exclusive of Audible audiobook. And if there are a bunch of audiobooks that are available on all the platforms except Audible that are best-sellers, that is the kind of thing that might actually finally get Audible to live up to the promise they made in 2008 when Amazon bought them and finally get rid of their DRM, a thing that they have promised for more than 12 years and never delivered on. Yeah, I, I think those are some fantastic points. Um, I, I'm really glad that you uh, brought that up, uh, you know, just because this is something that we uh, deal with a lot on the library end of things. and. and we often feel like we don't have a lot of uh, bargaining power, right? We're kind of at the the behest of what these large monopolies decide they want to, you know, charge to license something to us for, you know, six months or a year or what, whatever. So um, I, I do want to mention to um, folks who have joined us that if you uh, want to ask Corey a question, if you just put it in chat, I will monitor that so we can um, uh, ask him some questions. Um, but I did want to uh, just follow up on on DRM and and move into um, copyright uh, specifically a little bit because I think I think you um, have some really interesting ideas about what copyright could be or where it could go. Um, 
And uh, so, so I guess maybe uh, let's start with like, how, how do you see copyright as it currently exists and what should it be ideally as a writer? Well, I think that it's hard to tease copyright apart from the economic system that it's embedded in, right? We, we, we live in an age of um, effectively non-existent arts funding. And so instead what we do is we, we give out these exclusive rights to creators in the hopes that a market will form around them. And that's a kind of right-wing orthodoxy that is, um, it's the same thing that gives us like cap and trade and uh, surge pricing for Uber and so on. It's the idea that like the problem with markets, uh, the problem with, with resource allocation is that um, the price signals aren't uh, detectable by the actors in the market. And so you get these dysfunctional markets. You know, periodically you'll, you'll have people who've been reading this stuff, uh, mostly like Hernando de Soto, this, this um, sociopathic economist who, who will say like, I know what I'm gonna do. I, I have concluded that the reason that you can't get a table at a nice restaurant in San Francisco back when you could eat at a restaurant in San Francisco is that, uh, is that the reservations are all free. And so there aren't price signals. And so people can't figure out what I'm going to do. So I'm going to do the restaurants a favor. I'm going to build a botnet that books every table in every restaurant in San Francisco every night. And I'm going to start an auction site <laughs> to auction it off to rationalize the market. And, you know, like sometimes pricing can, can produce some market efficiency, some allocation efficiencies, but there are lots of ways in which this can go wrong. And, you know, this, and like there was a guy who made a, a, a parking spot system where if you were going to pull out of a, a parking spot in San Francisco, you could auction off the parking spot to someone else uh, before you left. Just all the, and they would have homeless people who would wash the parking spot between you pull. I mean, it's just like everything about it is terrible unless you're a bad person in which case it all sounds really great. And um, I think that there's a lot of that thinking in copyright that we're like, okay, well, you know, we have this very, um, uh, very uh, 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 quirky market in creative works because people are willing to do creative labor even without the expectation of return, right? There's this like kind of intrinsic human need to do creative work. And so, uh, given that and given that people produce with no rational expectation of a return what do we do to um to to get them rewarded and we we come up with and and you know it, authors fare very badly right it's not like it's not like they haven't put their finger on a problem here you know there are a lot of starving artists out there in the world and they're like well maybe we just like need to give them more exclusive rights kind of get the market going find a way to do it now you see things like um you can buy into private equity funds that are buying the back catalog of pop stars and stuff. All of this, this is all like grounded in the same thinking. And um, it doesn't work, right? It doesn't work for a lot of reasons, uh, but one of the most important ones is that creative markets turn out to be really easy to corner, right? To, to, if you wanna gatekeep those audiences, you can you know, consolidate publishing or, or music or film or TV into a very small number of hands, converge on a set of common terms, and they can be really exploitative and extractive. And then, you know, you can, um, the more copyright the uh, creators get, uh, the more you can demand as a condition for entry into the market. So, so like one example would be that there were these lawsuits over songs like Blurred Lines, where the Martin Gay estate sued uh, over, over the song. And they said, it's not a Martin Gay song. It doesn't contain any phrases from a Martin Gay's song, but, it's recognizably the kind of song Martin Gay would have written. And so it's a copyright infringement. And this very radical theory was embraced by the court. They basically created out of nowhere a copyright in vibes. And they, they argued that this copyright in vibes or grooves or whatever was in the benefit of authors, uh, of creators, because now it's a new right that they can sell in the marketplace. And you know, the Recording Industry Association of America and the other kind of music copyright maximalists have not been happy about these decisions. They've really raised a stink about it. But I don't worry about them. I think that like they have a really easy solution to this, which is they're just going to start saying as a condition of doing business with them, you have to sign away your vibe rights, right? And then like Universal just owns whole genres of music. And you know, they'll cross license to Sony and Warner, right? But if, if you want to be an independent label or an independent musician, 
and your music is recognizably music, you will have to uh, uh, enter into their um, seigneury, right? Into their into their uh, their their piecework plantation, and uh, I think it's like if you've got a kid who's being bullied for their lunch money, and you try to solve the problem by giving them more lunch money, right? It, it, the bullies just take all the money you give them. They have an endless appetite for for your kid's lunch money. Your kid will go hungry, and if you give your kid enough money, they'll start bribing the principal to look the other way, right? So, I think that the the way that we should be thinking about copyright or, or really about artists income is in this broader sense of rights that are anti-oligarchic right of rights that are not um expropriable rights that enforce pluralism rights that are um in service to the goal that copyright should be in service to which is to create the most diverse and uh um, interesting set of creative works that serves the largest group of audiences that we can reach rather than, you know, like we, we wouldn't call a copyright a good copyright if it made only one movie, even if that movie made a trillion dollars, right? Like that, that would just, that would be a, a wildly dysfunctional copyright system because we want thousands of movies that reach thousands of audiences. It's not how much money they generate. It's how, how many, how many actors get to um, uh, act upon our cultural landscape. So what would be some anti-oligarchic copyrights? <coughs> One is the reversion right. So the, the reversion right, which is very hard to exercise, allows creators to recover their copyrights after 35 years, irrespective of their contractual terms. Um, I'm a, a founding advisory board member of something called the Authors Alliance that is mostly made up of academic libraries uh, and run out of UC Berkeley in the Samuelson Clinic there. And um, our major project is showing academics how to claim back the copyrights that they signed away for free to monopolistic academic publishers 35 years ago, and then put those works in the public domain so that they can be accessed by all and not just people who wanna pay pay the, the subscription fee. You know, it's the public sphere, not the Elsevier, right? Um, another anti-oligarchic right is the compulsory license. Um, so I know that librarians are skeptical of the public lending right. I am very skeptical of the public lending right, but blanket licensing itself has solved a lot of really important deadlocks, right? Like think about um, nightclubs. If you're a DJ and you drop the needle on a record, you don't have to clear the song before the record starts spinning because the club pays a blanket license fee to a royalty society that then apportions the money. And royalty societies, collecting societies are terrible. Uh, but they're not intrinsically terrible, right? They're just terrible because they're opaque and mafiosic and, you know, uh, corrupt, right? But they could be transparent. There's no reason they couldn't be transparent. It's the 21st century. Like, you know, I'm not going to say the words blockchain because that would make me a terrible person, but we can have public ledgers. You don't need the blockchain, right? You can just stick that stuff on the web and people can see what's being collected and how it's being dispersed and how the monies are being calculated and so on. And you would get away from these crazy deals like, you know, where you have a society do a deal with someplace like Spotify, where the Spotify will say, okay, we're gonna pay you uh, $50 million up front for access to repertoire. Um, and, uh, and at the end of the first two years, uh, they've only generated $40 million in royalties. And so there's $10 million of unattributable revenue well, in theory, you should take that and like split it up among all the artists whose music was played or all the artists in the repertoire. Actually, they just give it to themselves, right? So that kind of shenanigan would be really easy to spot. The, those unattributable royalties would be really easy to spot if we had transparency. That is very anti-oligarchic and we could have a collective license for the web that would make anyone able to compete with Spotify or YouTube or Facebook as a music distribution service just by finding people who wanted to listen to music, not by going out and, and doing deals with major labels and societies. And then we could establish that the revenue from that statutory license would be apportioned preferentially to artists, that is to say natural human persons who perform or compose music and not to corporations. So because it's a statutory license, we could say half this money goes to human artists or their heirs not to corporations. 
doesn't matter what your contract says. So there are a lot of those proposals that you can imagine. And then if you want to throw the, the, the uh, gates open to wider policy considerations, trade unions, consortia, uh, guilds, um, uh, vigorous antitrust enforcement against entertainment companies and distributors, criminal penalties for financial fraud in the distribution side of things. Right, all of that stuff, um, unconscionable contract terms that cannot be contracted into. Like the Beatles original contract paid them one cent per record, except it was less than that because 15% of their royalties went to promotion for albums that were theoretically given away, except they were actually sold. So they got decimal eight five cents per record and it was divided four ways, right? So we could just make certain contractual terms unconscionable and unenforceable. Right? All of that stuff would do way more for making sure your kid got lunch than just giving them more lunch money and hoping the bullies exercised forbearance. Yeah, and, and kind of building on that, I, I am kind of curious about how, how you see kind of the kind of like punitive nature of, of copyright um, potentially stifling creativity, right? And I'm thinking specifically of, uh, you know, well, let's say science fiction, um, mm -hmm. where so much of the genre builds on itself and builds on concepts and, and tropes that came before, right? Do you, do you feel that copyright kind of um, disincentivizes that kind of um, engagement with, with other art? Well, you know, the, the practices of contemporary science fiction, or really of any genre, are much like libraries in that it is impossible to imagine that, that they would come into existence de novo today if they hadn't existed in the past, right? Uh, if you said, if you, if you had no system at all for deciding who owned what, and you said all of these things would just belong to everyone, you said, okay, well, I'm Edgar Allan Poe and I'm gonna invent the mystery story and mur you know, murders in the room org. Uh, and once I invent the mystery story, you know, putting all of my prodigious imagination into it, anyone is able to use it for free and I don't get any say over it. Like there's no way the contemporary economic system would allow that to come into existence. And it is being eroded at the margins, right? So uh, there have been a couple of really stupid lawsuits that established that characters could have a copyright separate from the works that they belong in. And so that's how you've seen, for example, the litigiousness of the Sherlock Holmes, uh, Edgar Allan, uh, uh, um, not Edgar Allan Poe, uh, uh, Doyle. Uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. Oh my God, I had such a brain moment there. Arthur Conan Doyle uh, and, his, and his useless heirs, you know, threatening people over this stuff and, and Robert Howard's heirs and H.P. Lovecraft's uh, uh, estate owners, which are not his heirs, and the you know the people who claim to own the estate of uh, that that controls um, uh, what's it called um, Buck Rogers and so on. So you know the the you certainly see this in in other domains m much more strongly, right? Like when sampling began, um, it was widely considered that sampling was just fair game, right? Like you know, Miles Davis would blow a solo and it'd go like for 32 bars and four bars of it would be like a Louis Armstrong song, just, you know, for giggles, right? Like, and not like worked in there in the hopes that no one would recognize it. It was an explicit reference performed in a way that everybody who listened to it understood where it came from. And that's how sampling got used in the early days. You listen to an album like uh, Paul's Boutique by the Beastie Boys, or It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back by Public Enemy, the two highest grossing hip hop albums, inflation adjusted of all time. And those samples do not hide their light under a bushel, right? Those samples are really explicitly meant to make you think about uh, popular famous songs. And um, over time, uh, the uh, juris jurisprudence of samples have actually been mostly pretty good. Uh, the, there have been two really important sampling lawsuits. One was over Oh Pretty Women, Oh, oh Pretty Woman, and Two Live Crew. And the court found that Two Live Crew was uh, engaged in critical commentary on, on Roy Orbison and uh, that it was therefore fair use. But there was another one involving uh, um, it's the two seconds in running uh, where, where they had used a very, very short sample. And their argument wasn't that it was fair use. Their argument was that it was de minimis, that it was below the threshold 
for copyright enforcement in the same way that like quoting, like you don't even have to ask whether it's fair use to include five pixels from a, from a photo, right? It's de minimis. It's below the point at which copyright trifles with or the law trifles with the subject, right? And uh, the court said, no, there is no sample so short that it isn't licensable, that it doesn't require a license, that there's no such thing as de minimis. It's an idiotic decision. And since fair use, right, this transformative or critical commentary defense is very fact intensive. And since there is no de minimis zone, and since music is controlled by three giant labels, we have reached a point now where nobody samples without permission. And that permission comes with a license and the licenses are unbearably expensive. They're so expensive that if you were to recreate Paul's Boutique or a Nation of a Million, it takes a Nation of Millions to hold us back today and clear those samples, not only would those records not be the highest grossing record albums, uh, hip hop albums of all time, they would lose something in the range of 10 to $15 million each, right? They'd be gigantic money losers. And uh, that's um, really changed the way that people make music, right? There is still hip hop that sounds like hip hop, that's sample heavy, but it's illegal, right? You, you have people like, um, oh God, what's his name? Um, oh. I am really blowing my buffer today, I'm sorry. Uh, there's an illegal artist, an illegal mashup artist who samples really, really aggressively. And uh, you know, his music isn't available for sale anywhere. It's, it's, you can get it for free, but you can't pay for it. And if they ever decide to sue him, they can turn him into a smoking rat. Girl Talk, that's his name. They, they can make him, uh, you know, they can take away everything he owns and, uh, and, and destroy his life forever. So this is not um, a positive, circumstance, right? This is not benefiting art or creativity. This is uh, snuffing out an entire music genre. Uh, if you've ever watched um, Kirby Ferguson's uh, Everything is a Remix, you'll see how much a film is grounded in this. Like, like every shot George Lucas used in Star Wars is a shot he lifted from somewhere else. And that's fine because originality is just hiding your influences. And he hides them really well. And he combines them in ways that are novel and creative and that puts something good into the world. But if we had a regime of the sort that is often argued for, then that movie wouldn't exist. Yeah, no, I think that's a really compelling argument. Um, and, and I think I, I, I wanted to uh, move over to that for a second because Scott asked something interesting here. Sure. Um, it, it says two research, researchers used a program to create thousands of melodies and put them in the market at public domain. Do you think this will have any impact on the market and copyright? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. You know, this happens like every 15 years. They're not the first ones. They're at least the third pair of people <laughs> to have done this. Um, and. I think that it depends on, like what it does is it pries apart the rail politique of copyright from the rhetoric of copyright. Because the rail politique is like, uh, well, you know, the, 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 the constitution instructs us to promote the useful arts and sciences by giving authors monopolies of limited times over their works. Uh, and so like, this is how you do it. Whenever there's a new work, you give a monopoly of a limited time, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, uh, and so it implies that if you pull a stunt like this, like if you somehow compose every melody and then dedicate them all to the public domain, that there will be no such thing as, as a new work, especially under these maximalist interpretations where, you know, there's no sample so small, no, no taking so small that it doesn't require a license. And therefore you can, um, uh, say everything is now free, right? Um, or, or you can say nothing can ever be made. And there's a very good science fiction story about this called Melancholy Elephants by uh, Spider Robinson that features like 150 year old Paul McCartney uh, being, you know, talking with someone about um, why everything needs to be put back in the public domain instead of having its copyright extended and extended. Uh, because if you, if you can't forget, then you can't make anything new. Uh, and the, the title, you know, Melancholy Elephants is like, well, elephants can't forget and no one's ever met a, a happy elephant. And all the elephants are melancholy because they can never forget. 
it's a very good story and spider's still kicking around doing his thing and being smart and good and 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 writing and saying good things um i think that the real politic though is that copyright enforcement is largely the province of corporate power right we're getting back to market power versus authors monopolies like if these guys were backed by a private equity fund and they were going to do like serial litigation and they were partly owned by a giant white shoe corporate law firm and uh you know there was like and they, they found jurisdictions with like loser pays legal fees as well and then what they actually did was they just shook down successful labels or or better yet they could do like the patent troll method which is like you, you start with the people who are broke and don't have anything and you offer them licenses for small amounts of money. And then you go to people who've got slightly more money and you go like, hey, guess what? Uh, 400 of your competitors have paid us for a license. Now you have, to a license. you have to buy a license. You don't mention that you charge them $5 each for the license and you want $10,000 from this mid-sized fish for it. We actually uh, once busted a patent for streaming video at EFF where the trolls who owned it had started with uh, porn sites. Uh, and they went after little, this is back before all the porn sites had been rolled up into one by this Canadian monopolist, uh, mind geek. But back when there were a ton of little porn sites, they went and they said like 200 bucks and you get a license and we go away. And they all gave them the 200 bucks. And then they started going to universities that were doing distance ed. And they said, we have a thousand customers for our license, uh, for our patent who have acknowledged that our patent is valid IP that you now need to take a license to. And then they started asking them for like $2,000 and they're working their way up to Disney and the BBC, right? That was their, that was their, their trajectory. So, you know, if those guys wanted to do that, they could probably cause a lot of harm, right? Um, but to just take this thing, this inert hard drive full of samples and connect it to a web server and say, ha ha, <laughs> is not going to actually like solve any of the problems. As a normative intervention, it's great, right? It, has, it makes these conversations take place but it will neither save nor destroy music. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I, I wanna be mindful of your time, so I'm gonna make this the last question. Okay. Um, Whoops. And I wanted to just ask briefly, because um, you've, you've spoken about um, like dystopia versus utopia before, and I, I wanted to ask you specifically in the context of, you know, this being 2020, where you see the place of utopian fiction and how that feeds into your activism maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my little riff on utopia is about um, the idea that a utopia is not a place where nothing goes wrong and that being, assuming nothing will break down doesn't make you an optimist, it makes you like an asshole, right? It's like, why should we put lifeboats on this Titanic? What could go wrong, right? What a good engineer does is they plan for uh, graceful failure. They go like, what, what can go wrong and how can we mitigate it? That's what makes you an optimist, right? The belief that you can mitigate crisis, that you can recover, that the machine can like glide to a graceful stop instead of exploding in white hot shrapnel, and then you can get it started again. And um, I, you know, we are at a crossroads. We're at a crisis. Crisis means crossroads. Rebecca Solnit writes about this. She says, you know, when a doctor says you are in crisis, what they mean is you are at the crossroads where you either get better or you die. And we are in this crossroads. And you know, I have to say, if you want my like rosiest take on the, the plague, it's this. Uh, a year ago, if you'd asked me, I would have given pretty strong odds that by the time we figured out that we had structural deficits in our society that were going to lead to species endangering climate change, we would have doomed at least say two or three billion people to die. And that now, thanks to the crisis, maybe we can make those structural reforms after only two or three million people die. And you know, like sucks to be them, sucks to be us, but when life gives you SARS, you make SARS barilla, right? And uh, I am now working on a novel uh, that I started just before the plague, uh, that is three quarters done called uh, The Lost Cause. And it's a utopian post Green New Deal novel about a world in which all of the things that would be in an ecological disaster novel are front and center. Wildfires, floods, 
zoonotic plagues, mass migration, refugee crisis after refugee crisis, but it's a utopia in the sense that everyone there has recognized that, the, that these are the results of structural problems and have set themselves to reform the structure and take care of one another while they're doing it. They're literally relocating every coastal city in the world 20 kilometers inland, right? They're, they're doing the work. And they call themselves the first generation in a century not to fear the future. And I think that, you know, we know at least most of the things that we need to do to get through not just the plague, but, but the climate crisis, the climate emergency. They're hard things, but they're not like um, technologically challenging things, right? How do you move a city 20 kilometers inland? One brick at a time, right? It's a logistics problem. It's not a technological problem. Uh, and we have it in our grasp to do it. And like the sooner we confront that, the fewer people will die because we, we waited too long. And so there would be, I think, an enormously liberating sense of confidence and, and hope that would come from confronting the crisis instead of denying it. I think that is a, a wonderful little grace note to end on. Thank you. You mentioned that the Kickstarter is still ongoing. How much longer is that going and where can we find it? Nine more days. Um, the easiest thing probably is to Google Cory Doctor Kickstarter, but uh, it is, let's see, it's linked from my Twitter bio. So if you go to twitter.com slash doctor O, you'll find it there. And the short link is tinyearl.com slash attack surface KS. And, that, uh, uh, and that's all lowercase. Okay, awesome. I will provide a link in the uh, video description whenever I get this uploaded. Uh, Excellent. Yeah, and, and thank you so much for just sharing uh, with us about your work and your activism and everything. That was fantastic. So I really... It was my pleasure. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Well, take care. Keep all right. right. Thank you. And I, I should mention, given that you're all librarians and an and L school, that I'm a recovering library worker, uh, page and cataloger. And that I, uh, one of my proudest achievements is I'm a visiting professor of practice in library science at the University of North Carolina. So greetings, fellow academic librarian people, although you actually do academic library work, whereas I just get to put it on my resume. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's thank fantastic. You. Well, thank you so much, Corey. And thanks All right. for, for being here. Thanks, guys.